This is part two of my conversation with my guest and expert witness, Ben Lindsay, the founder and CEO of Power the Fight. We talk together about principle one, an ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory. I love that conversation because for me, Ben embodies exactly that principle. He gets on with the job down in South London, working with young people and bringing them hope. Does that resonate with you in any way? Uh, Massively. Uh, So much, which you've said, which is the philosophy for why I'm here and the passion and desire I have to serve young people and families, not just in South East London, but beyond. There's so much I've experienced in the last 20 plus years, which what you've just spoken about, particularly where money is wasted, particularly where people, MPs, decision makers, local government, central government, uh, come up with short-term ideas. And we're we're governed by the election cycle, right? So Mm -hmm. what is in vogue for four years, five years? Quick fix. Quick fix comes in and then it changes depending on whatever the flavour of the week or the month is, right? Buzzwords. Hmm. And at the moment, everything's very trauma informed. Right? Yeah. That's the best the buzzword. So I've lived it, and I've and I've been through it. And yeah, there's so much. I mean, similar story. The the two young people who I mentioned at the start. So Myron was murdered in the tw- in 2016, and then as I said, his best friend Leonardo was was killed um, five months later. But in between Myron's death and and Le- Leonardo's murder, Leonardo went to go and see his his old head teacher to say, I am struggling with the death of my friend. I need some type of therapeutic support. And the head teacher went to the local authority and said, you know, I've got this young person. Um, he needs some some wellbeing support, therapeutic support. And um, as you can imagine, the local authority came back to the head teacher and basically said, the waiting lists are too high. We can't support him at the moment. But more problematically said, are you sure he knows what he's talking about when he says he needs therapeutic support? And a few months later after that, he lost his life. Similar to your point you you said about those two young people, I know if there was the therapeutic support available, if it was what I would call culturally sensitive support, because our own research says that so many of the young people and families that we engage with will not go to see therapists who do not share the same culture and experiences as they do. I'm guaranteed, I think we would have had a, more, a, a stronger chance of him staying alive. So I, I totally resonate with with what you've said. I think your point around almost doing the work, doing the testing at a micro level is definitely a value which I have at Powder Fight. We work in a very, we was working in boroughs of Lewisham and, and, and Southwark. And it's really interesting when you have success We've worked in numerous schools in those in those boroughs. We've seen young people's well-being increase. We've seen school exclusions drop. And then what happens, and you'll be well aware of this through your work with Oasis, is that the bigger funders start saying, right, we now want to expand across London and across the UK. And while I think actually scale, scaling is really important when it's done well, what I'm not a fan of is scaling when things haven't been tested properly. And therefore, for me, we want to do micro well and then get to the macro. But what happens, you become flavor of the month, it's very much like, no, 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 we want you in 500 schools. And I, and I think there is a, it's a quality control. There's very much about quality c- control. And I think, you know, your point about how do we, how do we empower communities to have a voice is something which is the reason why I launched a charity. So many times we were not hearing from the young people impacted by the violence, the families who've been impacted by the violence, the parents and carers. And I wanted to create a charity and a space where those voices could go up to the very highest level. So I sit on Sadiq Khan's Violence Reduction Unit Partnership Reference Group. The voices of the community I carry into those spaces, whether it's youth violence commissions, uh, cross-party commissions, I've taken families and young people and parents of lost loved ones to parliament. And I think the complexity of something like violence impacting young people and families is just not understood at a level. It's just not understood at all. But 
I know there were, there'd been murders which have happened recently in various boroughs in London, which if you mapped, you could map, map right back to 2005. Unfortunately, no local government organisation, central government organisation has the resources to do the proper mapping exercises that we really need. Yes, we've lost 1.4 billion of youth services since 2010, 2011. But like you said, even if you had the money, it, how it is distributed to the community is, is really important. And, and I have been that frustrated youth worker where, like you said, oh, we need more youth workers or we need a youth centre or we need more therapeutic support. Um, and ultimately the money hasn't been distributed in what I would say the, the right way. So there, there's so much. And, you know, I think the hope point is so important for us to understand that in the deepest darkest moments of pain for people who have lost loved ones to violence how do you deliver hope i have lost count i've literally lost count of the amount of families i have visited over the last 20 years to talk about um to support hold hands listen cry pray with who've lost young people to violence and it, it's interesting when you do that quite a few times you start seeing patterns. You start mm. seeing patterns of, of of what is said and what people hold on to with hope. One of the most interesting things for me is that every single family I have engaged with, they will, you know, we'll talk about burying the young person, we'll talk about finances, we'll talk about, um, uh, you know, therapeutic support. Every single family I've ever worked with have come to me afterwards and said, I want to set up a charity or foundation. Mm. In, in the name of my of my of my son or my daughter or, or whatever's happened, and that tells you something. It tells you that even in the deepest darkest moments of despair, they're looking for something where the death isn't in vain. They're looking for some type of hope. Now, what's interesting for me, I often say, "Come back to me in six months." I often say, "I can either help you do that if that's what you want to do, or I have my own charity called Power to Fight." where we can honour the memory of your of your your loved one, we can get your voices heard, we can really listen to what you you feel needs to happen. But the idea of setting up a charity, <laughs> running it, maintaining it, getting funding is a headache. Mm. So let me take that headache off you. And nine out of ten times, six months later they'll come back and be like, okay, they're still grieving. And they'll be like, okay, sometimes it is right for, for people to set something up. But often we can then talk and say, okay, cool. Let's see what we can now do to make sure that the experiences that you've had, mm. the voices that you have can really try and make, make a massive mm. difference. Mm. So uh, there's a lot. And, you know, for me, the Power to Fight story is a bit of a variation of what of a story you you mentioned. For me, the, I think it was Desmond Tutu who, who you know, you have these, uh, these quotes and these mm. stories and you, you know, it's probably about 10 different versions and different <laughs> different people who would say different things. But I think the version Desmond Tutu said was, you know, there was um, children being thrown in the river mm. and everybody was finding these children who were drowning in the river. And every now and again, the village would, would go and pull these uh, kids out. And every now and again, they would save a couple, but every morning they'd find that these children are drowning in the river and more and more people decided to try and help. And before you knew it, the whole village were there pulling kids out. And some of them would drown and some of them would be saved until somebody turned around and said, let's go upstream and find out who's throwing them in the river in the first place. And I think it is very much, for me, are we prepared to get to the root causes of this mm -hmm. issue? Are we really, when it comes to violence, when it comes to um, the pain that families are going through, are we prepared to get to the root issues? And this is why with Power to Fight, one of the first things I did was like, we're going to have a research arm. We're going to have a research arm, but we're going to ask the questions which no one else is asking. You know, we're going to we're going to use the voices of the people who are who wouldn't ever get an opportunity to sit. And so your whole your whole thing about theory, I'm not against it. I'm doing a PhD, you know, <laughs> but I'm also know I've got 25 years of lived experience as well. Hmm. So there's kind of something about, you know, these think tanks. I remember, I won't name them, but I remember you, you'll know them. But, you know, back in back in the day, 
the amount of think tanks I had, <sighs> we'd like to interview you about this and about that and gangs and knife crime. And then the report would come and yeah. it wouldn't be your words. Mm. So how, so there's something about how do you make sure that the voices, the authentic voices, the people who are going through these issues really do have the opportunity to share their experience and not just share their experiences, actually shape policy. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very important. So Power of the Fight was mm. born because of this. Yeah. Power of the Fight, I suppose when I think back, it's, you know, when you have 20 years of experience and you're watching multiple things, first of all, I'm seeing youth workers and youth practitioners working really hard in youth offending services and community safety teams. And the first thing I'm, I'm seeing, Steve, is actually burnout. Mm. I'm seeing lots of burnout and a lack of what we would now call clinical supervision. Mm. So that's the first thing I'm seeing. You know, um, and then I'm I'm also seeing this rinse and repeat cycle. A hmm. little bit of money here, hmm. another government report here. You know, everyone thinks they've they've invented sliced bread, and then it's like, all right, yeah. I see, I see that again and again. Then the riots happen. Hmm. You know, 2011, and suddenly, you know, it's what was the term? Cameron called it, was it uh, Troubled Families? That's it, wasn't it? Yeah. It was like, oh, it's trouble, it's tr yeah. 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 It's Troubled Families and women. And, you know, you saw this ridiculous amount of um, sentencing for people who stole nappies mm. and people who stole bottles of water. And you're like, this is what it's really come to, right? And all the time, violence is going up, knife crime's going up. So I'm seeing all this type of stuff. And, and, and as a pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this in my communities as well. I'm like, well, actually, what is the church response to this? Mm -hmm. I always say about when it comes to church, we, we have three things <laughs> which our government don't have. So first of all, we have unlimited buildings. Mm -hmm. Buildings everywhere. More buildings than pubs and <laughs> coffee shops, right? Uh, and then we have the biggest volunteer resource as well so we've got people we've got we've got men and women who are prepared to give their time and energy and then you know you're a theologian so depending on your theology we have unlimited resources mm. <laughs> depending on you know, on what you believe finances most churches i know have lots of money so that combination mm. as a pastor growing up in in in, in working in southeast london was like we can do we can do more but i think part of the problem with the church and I, I say specifically the church, this might be a case of all faith groups, but definitely with my experience with the church is that we often want to own the situation as opposed to collaborate. Mm. And I see the church as being part of the solution, not necessarily the solution when it comes to these types of issues. Mm. So for me, it was always about how do we collaborate? How do we work with the best of the communities around us to try and have this more holistic approach? So how to fight was, you know, a value was collaboration. It was how do we make sure that what we do really empowers the communities? Do we have young people's voices in this? Do we have people who have lost loved ones' voices in this? Is it culturally sensitive? This was a bugbear for me. I was always like, the people I'm seeing talking on this stuff do not look like the people who I am working with do not sound like the people who I'm working with, do not have the experiences of the people that I am engaging with, mm. yet you're somehow the expert. Mm. You have no cultural legacy, intelligence, awareness, competency, sensitivity, humility to be engaging with this issue. Yet you are the people and your salaries are big, but you're the people people are listening to. So I wanted to change that narrative. I was always like, well, how do we, how do we change that narrative? So Power to Fight was born out of pain and, and, and real suffering. And like I said, the young man who was murdered is somebody I knew, knew the family very well. But it also represents hope. I called it Power to Fight because I believe the term fight is often seen as a negative, but the reality is that communities on a daily basis are fighting for survival. Mm -hmm. They're fighting for their children. We're fighting for our communities. We're, so, mm -hmm. we're fighting to be heard. We're fighting for justice. That's not a negative. That is that is a positive. How mm -hmm. you power that fight though, mm -hmm. will determine whether you'll be victorious in that. Mm -hmm. So for me, you mentioned something earlier on about equipping. Yeah, I want to make sure that teachers and police officers and the community are equipped 
to deal with this issue. This is a very different issue. You spoke about David Beckham. I remember David Beckham as well. Uh, <laughs> but I also know what it what it was like growing up in South East London in 1993, where Stephen Lawrence was murdered a mile away from my school. And I know what it's like talking to young people in 2023, and they can't relate to that. Hmm. So when I say to young people, yeah, I didn't really have much of an issue with people who looked like me. I had an issue with National Front and the BNP. And they would say, sir, are you honestly telling me that you were running away from white people? I was like, yeah, because these were the people who wanted to kill me and my friends simply because of our skin color. So then you have this conversation with young people and then, and then they say to me, oh, but sir, are you honestly saying if you saw someone who looked exactly like you walking down the street, you wouldn't be nervous? I'm like, no, if I see someone who looks like me, I might give them what we call in South East London, a black man nod, you know, as, as, a, as a sense of solidarity, or I might just go about my business. And these young people, so it isn't just about black people, but this young, this young person said to me, you know, if I see someone who's dressed like me, if I see someone who looks like me and I don't know them, my assumption is they're carrying a knife. So when this young person said this to me, the research in me just couldn't help but come out. So there was a class of 30, and this is black and white and boys and girls, short and small. And I said to them, right, we've just heard this young man's comment. Hands up if this is your fear as well, that you, if you see someone who looks like you, you don't recognize, not from the area, your assumptions that they're carrying a knife. Mm. Steve, every hand went up. Every Boy. single hand went up. What does that tell you? It tells you that we have a generation, a young generation who are fearful more than anything else. Mm. They're fearful. The anxiety, the fear, the, 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 we, and we can talk about social media. We can talk about the things which they are seeing on a regular basis on Snapchat and, and multiple other social media platforms where violence is the norm. I remember young people who were murdered. And this is what, this is a story I talk about in my own book. If, I, if I'm allowed to plug books in my own book. You can plug a book. What's it called? It's called, we need to talk about race, understanding the black experience in white majority churches, a very long winded title, but it was an important one. And I talk about in that book, a, a, a story when I was at a youth festival hmm. and a young man, and this youth festival was in Norwich. So, you know, 200 miles away from London. And a young man was murdered in Peckham in South East London. And because of social media and technology, the fact, it, no, bear in mind there's 7,000 kids mm. at this youth festival and a thousand of them were from London. Mm. And because of Snapchat, within a minute, all the London children had mm. the, the aftermath wow. of the murder on their mobile phones. Wow. So now, we have a safeguarding issue in Norwich, <laughs> even though the situation is in London. Yeah. That is, when you really think about it, the way technology moves and how violence and fear moves in a way which just wasn't my experience. Mm. So we have to, talking about what is needed, we have to appreciate that we are dealing with a different beast to what we were dealing with five years ago, mm. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Technology has made it very difficult to contain fear. And if, and these are the, and this is not me just saying this, this is young people saying this. This is, you know, they can't believe there was a moment where mobile phones didn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> they can't believe it. Um, they, they can't believe there was a moment where music was physical. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you, what's a tape cassette? What's a, what's vinyl? I'm like, yeah, this is how we used to play music, CDs. No, no, it, it's really, really complicated. And I say all that because going back to your point about being equipped, are we, are the teachers, I'll put the question to you, are the teachers in Oasis, do they feel equipped to be dealing with the issues and the fears and the concerns and the joys? Yeah. Because I don't just want to talk about the depressing stuff of the young people in your schools? Well, I think this plays right in, back into this principle. Um, so it, it happens that Oasis, along with three other multi-academy providers, we've been asked by government just now to set up something called the National Institute of Teaching. So uh, Oasis is in the process of building two 
teachers training colleges and there are others being built by our partners around the country. There'd be five altogether. And to look at teacher training because, as you know, Ben, um, there's so many teachers don't last very long in the profession. If you just, uh, you know, you could talk about all sorts of other professions mm. that are that are um, youth-centric, that people struggle in. But, you know, classically, well, here's, here's a story a story that I know, and I know this story well, no, no, uh, many times. You know, a young person grows up in, uh, in, in leafy suburbia or uh, out in a provincial town, and they go to a really good um, school, often an independent school, a grammar school. They get a great education, um, in which they're equipped for great A-level passes. Then they go on to college, often Oxbridge, et cetera, et cetera. And they care so much. They are passionate. They're young. They're driven by an ideology that talks about equality and opportunity for everyone. And so they go and they sign up for a teacher uh, training year at the end of their degree and they head off to serve in the toughest on the toughest school in the toughest council uh. estate and in two terms they are ground into the dirt yes. because no one's equipped them to right. learn uh, my story is a variation of that my story mm. is as a church pastor for 10 years in South East London I would often get um students come and teach first and in places like this and they'd land in South East London and they would have had that experience and that background great schools lived outside of London and had come and I'd be like hi you know as, as a pastor you welcome people and all that type of stuff and they'd be like yeah I'm a teacher I've done my teach I'm doing my teach first um, I've come from a place, you know, I always pick on the valleys of Wales. I love I love Wales, it's fine. I haven't got an issue with Wales, I've got family in Wales, great. But they come from places like that and they'd always go to the most deprived, mm. um, some might call ghetto, you know, not my language, but people would say this, school in, in the borough. Because they want their lives to make a difference. They want their lives to make a difference. It's, it's a good heart. Which yeah. is not, it's not, I'm, not I'm not questioning the heart. What I'm questioning is then I say to myself in my mind, I'm going to give you three months. Hmm. And then what happens in three months is that they the, they don't connect well with the community. They don't connect well with the parents and carers. They don't connect well with the children. The very edgy estate that they were living in because it's cheap, which was cool, now is actually quite scary. And then in a year's time, they're, they're now working at independent school in, in the borough. So... That was my story. I saw this again and again and again. And this leads right to my PhD, which I'm now doing up in, in Durham. And it's all about cultural, the lack of cultural sensitivity in teacher training. We teach tr teachers to, to be qualified in a particular subject or working in a particular school. What we don't do is train them to be equipped to work in inner city communities, inner city areas. We don't do that. We don't give them the tools to be culturally sensitive, culturally intelligent, culturally aware. It's not just teachers. The police will be a similar thing. Yeah. And I should introduce you to a friend of mine who works in Oasis and is working at this the whole time because this is what the government have asked us to help them with. Yeah. So um, uh, she is brilliant and yeah. needs to meet you. No, we, we should talk because this mm. is not just the PhD, but going back to Power to Fight, we have worked with hundreds of schools. We've trained over 13,000 practitioners in the last four years, but we've worked with hundreds of schools specifically working on cultural sensitivity. We deliver day training. We, you know, we work alongside schools around their policies because what people don't understand, and this is the sinister part, the lack of cultural sensitivity has a direct correlation with certain children being excluded from school. If the only time you have seen a working class white boy or the only time that you've, we've engaged with a working class black girl is through watching a particular TV show, well, guess what? And that particular TV show only shows drugs uh, and crime and gangs. And then you come into my children's school in South East London and my children are not gang in gangs and carry knives and all that type of stuff your biases impact their, their flourishing. Absolutely. And, and that's why Power of Fight was also launched. Power of Fight was launched about the systemic issues. 
Are we prepared to get to the root causes of this stuff? Are we prepared to challenge teachers and the police and doctors and NHS and psychologists and therapists and every single person who's engaging with young people in the inner city context? So actually, you do present hope as opposed to fear when they eventually come into your practice, into your classroom, you know, this type of stuff. So for me, how you're, we are hope dealers, you know, you're a hope dealer. I'm such a, a fan of the work that you have done with Oasis and uh, it's been a bit of a blueprint for Power to Fight and everything that we're doing because we are very much about getting to the root causes and we're doing incredible work, but we need more. It's not just, it's not, it can't just be Oasis. It can't just be Power to Fight. And I think the, the bigger problem that we don't have, the way the game is rigged, and this is something which annoys me so much, the way the game is rigged is that Power to Fight and Oasis won't naturally work together mm. because we're seen as competitors. Mm. Well, no, Oasis is going for this money or Power to Fight is going mm. for this money mm. as opposed to saying, well, actually, how do we collaborate? And we don't collaborate enough. It's only when we collaborate and our voices come together that we can really make a difference. Thank you, Ben. That was fantastic. And if you ever, anyone ever needed any evidence that a, an ounce of practice is worth more than a ton of theory, you've just delivered it. Bless you. Thank you for having me. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And like I said, I'm a massive fan of what you're doing. And I will make sure that everybody reads your book. So, um, yeah, thank you for having me. It's been great. <laughs>